This is Twit. Uh, hopefully, it won't come as a surprise to any of our listeners uh, to learn that they don't want to have off-brand, no-name, <laughs> IoT smart doorbells. Yeah, yeah that sounds right. Uh, the yeah. likes of <laughs> yeah, the likes of which are sold on Amazon and eBay. Uh, you don't want those anywhere near your homes. Matt Lewis of the NCC Group and their researchers took a look at the operation of 11 off-brand El Cheapo bargain smart doorbells and found their intelligence to be somewhat lacking, shall we say. Uh, <laughs> Matt said, our findings could cause issues for consumers and are indicative of a wider culture that favors shortcuts over security in the manufacturing process. Yeah, okay, no big surprise there. He added, however, we're hopeful that the much-anticipated IoT legislation will signal a watershed moment in IoT security. Until this comes to fruition, we must continue to work together to highlight the need for basic security by design principles and educate consumers about the risks and what they can do to protect themselves. Um, so, okay, so first of all, this IoT legislation Matt's referring to, uh, it's hopeful. It's been moving along since uh, its introduction in 2017 by uh, Senator Mark Warner, uh, and it uses the typical, you know, what can the government do, carrot and stick security requirements uh, so, you know, you need to do these things in order to get a government procurement contract. Um, uh, and it does include a bunch of stuff we need. So clearly, you know, some IOT security aware people were involved. Uh, the legislation, if it happens, uh, and it's like it's still alive and maybe it will, um, it requires that vendors, for example, commit that their IOT devices are patchable. So yay for that. Um, also that the devices don't contain known vulnerabilities. If a vendor identifies vulnerabilities, that vendor must disclose them to an agency with an explanation of why the device can be considered secure, notwithstanding the vulnerability and a description of any compensating controls employed to limit the exploitability and impact of the vulnerability and then based on that information, an agency's CIO could issue a waiver to request the ability to purchase the device. The third requirement is that the devices rely on standard protocols, which only seems great. Let's not roll our own and say, oh, this is better than anything else. And then fourth, the devices don't contain hard-coded passwords. So that's obviously a really good thing. It's going to be difficult, though, to do because when you think about it, I mean, the it, you know hard-coded passwords we know are bad, but not having them is going to require some interesting workarounds. So you know the bill is not yet law, uh, and there are exemptions in there that are so large you could drive a truckload of dumb doorbells through them. So you know we'll see how this turns out. Um, uh, but it's certainly true that having any sort of of legislation would be a lot better than just what we have now, which is this totally unregulated environment. Um, OK, but specifically of these 11 devices, two of the devices that these guys tested were manufactured by Victure, V-I-C-T-U-R-E and Citronics, C-T-R-O-N-I-C-S. They had critical vulnerabilities that could allow bad guys, not surprisingly, to steal the user's home network password. The flaws would also allow attackers to hack not only the doorbells, but also the residential router that the doorbell was connected to and any other smart devices in the home, you know, thermostat, other cameras, uh, and even get into household computers. The and for example, this Victor smart video doorbell is its formal name, uh, was found to be sending the customer's home Wi-Fi network name and password unencrypted to servers in China. 
So, you know, there is absolutely no need for a locally connecting Wi-Fi device to export its local network credentials to anywhere. But, you know, you buy some Victor smart doorbell, you know, from Guangdong, China, and plug it in. And I mean, you know, hey, look, it works. Well, yeah, but it's also sent your network credentials to China. You know, maybe that's not a big problem, but doesn't have to do that. There's no there's no conceivable use case for doing that. So, you know, maybe that's not what you want. Um, and remember, Leo, that the, the visual that we set up on a podcast a, a few months ago, um, actually, we were talking about this after I had attached a few smart plugs to my network. I wanted some like some simple oh, yeah, timers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we were well. And in fact, a uh, I, I did add a um, an IoT thermostat to my environment here, and I had a, a also a, a a humidity sensor and a and, and a separate logging thermostat. And I could just just imagine like the a globe showing you know and of course uh, in like movies like war games we see all the little lines tracing an arc through through the upper atmosphere of the of of incoming missiles well imagine all of the iot devices in the us with their connections back to servers in china i mean that's where they're connecting. You know, that's where my doorbell, and I don't, actually I don't have a doorbell. That's where my thermostat and my my you know, IoT plugs are connecting, which of course is why I would argue it is crucial that they be on an isolated network as all of mine are. Um, you know, it's sort of, you know, and when, when you picture that, all of these tens, hundreds of millions of, of connections uh, we remember that story about the Trojan horse from uh, olden times. So anyway, uh, Matt said, if stolen, this data obviously could allow a hacker to access people's home Wi-Fi, enabling them to target their private data, access any smart devices they own, and so forth. Um, the researchers found that another device bought from eBay and Amazon without any clear brand associated to, to it. It was literally a no-name smart doorbell uh, was vulnerable to the crack exploit. Uh, that's the key reinstallation attack that was discovered three years ago in 2017. So these devices don't have up-to-date Wi-Fi stacks? Imagine that. Uh, on the other hand, why would they? Of course, the crack attack opens any attached network to intrusion by allowing the network's WPA and WPA2 encryption to be cracked without much effort, given, you know, state-of-the-art cracking tools. So, of course, again, none of this comes as any great surprise, but I think it's nice to examine some specifics from time to time because it's too easy to sort of wave off generalities. Um, the advice, of course, if you want to buy a smart doorbell, um, there is, I would say, very good reason, especially smart doorbell. You got a video camera, right? You know, ain't, you know, like that anybody monitoring it can see what's going on out of your front door, can see when you all leave the house, can see when you come in, can watch what's going on around you. Um, anyway, it's, I, I would argue there's very good reason to stick with major brands. You're going to pay more, but... I mean, you have to care about security and you, you, I mean, unless you take personal responsibility for what one of these devices does, uh, you have, you, you have to isolate it on its own network. And I would argue buy from a major brand, even if there is a problem and, and, you know, we know these things are going to have problems. Uh, the problems will make the headlines the vulnerabilities will be found and cured responsibly and promptly uh, as opposed to absolutely never. So anyway, I just thought it neat that these guys took the time 
to just sort of say, let's take a look at these doorbells and see what they're doing. And yeah, to no one's surprise. 